All right, DJ Chuang is here, and I am joined on the Social Media Church podcast today with Steve Knight. Uh, he blogs over at nightopia.org. Is that dot right? com. Dot Sorry. com. Oh, I'll have to edit that out. <laughs> so what we do on the video portion is the video portion is the raw video conversation, and then the podcast on the audio side is post-produced, and then we cut out oh, the nice. clubs. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Noise. Some people like it more authentic, so this is the authentic experience. That's right. And exactly. The audio has the little more polished for people on the drive time and don't want to waste time with the idle chatter as I'm engaging in right here. <laughs> cool. Great. So, nitopia.com. It is like Utopia, but better. That's right. And Steve, I've connected with him for over the past decade as we were early in the days of blogging and we've uh, shared the stage once talking about internet evangelism and he's had quite the spiritual journey and now he finds himself in the midst of a missional church uh, network and conversation and so there's a lot of talk in the mainstream evangelical world and actually the broader world of Christianity about the yeah. missional church and being missional and having missional community. So yeah. help us navigate into your um, experience with the missional church. What is it and what's going on? Yeah, you bet. Well, I mean, I think that's, um, you know, I, I come from an evangelical background, um, and so that was my first exposure to any of that sort of language about missional church. Um, came um, came from the evangelical world, but um, as I, I kind of find myself now more in the mainline Protestant world, working for a mainline Protestant denomination, um, it's a conversation that's that's pretty broad and it's pretty theologically broad, and there's a lot of there's a lot of definitions. Um, I think that's one of the strengths of missional, but it's also a weakness at the same time. Um, you know, uh, for me, missional. The, the sort of elevator speech that I typically give is that missional is participating with God in what God is doing in the world. And depending on where, where, you, know, where you land theologically, um, you're going to sort of interpret that and define that and, 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 and activate that in different ways. So you're going to participate with God in, um, on one end of the spectrum, maybe more traditional evangelism, on another end of the spectrum social justice, things like that. Um, and everywhere, everything, you know, sort of uh, uh, in between and kind of even beyond. Um, but uh, so, so that's, um, to me, um, if we talk about emergence within Christianity and kind of these kind of major shifts that social media and the web have been a huge catalyst in kind of, you know, really changing a lot of things um, and, it ha and forcing us to adapt in a lot of different ways, um, this missional shift is a big part of that. It's a big part of, of, of rethinking how we think about the church in relation to what God is doing in the world. And, and, and I, I love this word participatory. That's kind of been a word that I've kind of, uh, kind of honed in on because uh, it's, it's active. It's, it's, it's not about sitting back and receiving. It's about going and doing and, um, and being engaged. And so um, I think that's... Um, that's what I mean. That's what missional is is for me. But we're part part of a local faith community here in our local context, and we're figuring out what does that look like for us. How what is God doing here, and how how should we be participating in that? And um, and so that's uh, just a little kind of I guess snippet of of missional. Okay. Well, thanks for framing that up. The um, listeners here at Social Media Church, a lot of them are church leaders in the conventional. Uh, organized church and so there's a paid staff who are the pastors and then there's the congregation or laity and people who participate in the activities that are programmed in the church and so when you use the word participate it sounds yeah. a lot more autonomous a lot more uh, individualized if you will and how does social media feed into that yeah well, that's a good question because I mean I, I um... It is different. Um, it is it is a, kind of a different spin on this idea of participation. But I w I would say it's it's um, it's it may be just a different way of organizing um, than traditional church has done it. 
Um, it still takes organization. It still takes leadership. It still takes vision and passion and, and um, all, all those same sort of giftings and abilities. And um, so those things, you know, certainly aren't going away. Um, the social media piece, I think, is interesting is that you have more and more communities um, you know, typically a lot of missional communities are, are tend to be smaller. They tend to be very local, hyper-local, um, focused on a neighborhood or a specific area of a city um, as opposed to, you know, entire city or, or you know, um, something larger um, like you might find with a megachurch or something like that. So, so their use of social media um, is, is, is very hyper-local and it's a way to extend beyond um, the gathering of the community, you know, because, um, and I think this is, uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's ways that people do this differently, but with, even with missional, there is a, there is a gathering and there's a sending. And the, and the difference is that it's sort of inverted where a lot of traditional churches focused on the gathering on the sort of weekly worship event, um, with missional, it's, it's sort of trying to turn that outward and say, we, we gather to be sent, and the focus is really on the Monday through Saturday, or or whatever you know day of the week that that gathering um, happens. Um, so 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 then social media is used to to help connect the community throughout the week and talk about uh, things that are happening in home groups or um, uh, you know different events in the community that 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 people are engaged with. Okay, so let me you know, do a compare and contrast. So in a uh, conventional church, uh, uh, internet technologies and social media is used as a means of extending their broadcast of the uh, packaged and branded and prepared um, teachings of that particular organized church. And so social media becomes the carrier and the link to messages, the link to discussion guides, the link to events, and that's just pushed out. And so people uh, virally send out prepared content. And so how is that different in the uh, church that is being sent and social media is being used in a uh, sending mode rather than a gathering yeah. mode? Well, I think, I, I think for both kinds of communities, if they're doing social media right, they're, they're using social media to, as a listening platform, not just a broadcast platform. So I would hope that the, the, the more traditional churches that are doing that, that are using social media to amplify and, and expand their, their message are also listening. And, and the ones that I, that I uh, see doing that, they're, they're, they're good at both. They're really paying attention and they're in, engaging and, they're, and, and there is conversation going on. I would say for the smaller missional communities, it is more focused on, on dialogue and conversation and relationship um, on, on a, on a uh, you know, a smaller scale. Um, and so that's, um, you know, social media works um, and functions well for that, as well as um, for sort of amplifying and, sp and spreading um, a bigger message. Um, so I, I, I guess that would maybe be the main difference. But, you know, I think both, uh, both, both should be, um, if they're doing, doing it well, listening and engaging and, and, and participating in conversation. Okay, describe a little more of how you do that um, kind of active listening on social media. What tools are you using and what are you listening for and how do you respond? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, my sort of main tool that I use uh, is Hootsuite um, to follow, uh, you know, a number of different uh, Twitter accounts that I manage, um, you know, update uh, Facebook um, from there. You can. Um, I do that uh, occasionally. Um, Primarily through hashtags. Um, I mean, hashtags, um, you know, there's a missional hashtag. There's, you know, a number of different hashtags. You know, here in Charlotte, North Carolina, there's a CLT hashtag. Um, if I want to see, um, you know, kind of what people are talking about in my city, there's a, there's a hashtag for your city, and you can um, see what people are talking about. There's a hashtag for your, uh, maybe your, even your local neighborhood or community. So there's, there's ways that you can engage through those hashtags to really connect with other people. I just connected with somebody right here in my city yesterday who's uh, on Twitter and, uh, you know, a local mom slash bartender. Um, and, uh, and, you know, um, I you know, found her through the Gastonia hashtag. Um, and so we're following each other on Twitter now. Um, 
and so uh, that's prime. That's the primary um, thing I would say. Um, okay. And, and well, hashtags share. are great for people that are familiar with uh, Twitter. There's still a lot of people on Twitter who don't understand hashtags. Sure. So how about the rest of the world that's on Facebook and not on Twitter? Do mm. you try to engage them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, I think through Facebook pages um, and and you know, I I have you know personally spend a lot of time on Facebook with my own personal profile. I have a Facebook page as well. We have a Facebook page for our our local faith community here, um, and and that's um, that you know that's another place. But you have to get people to like your page in order to get those updates and engage them in those conversations. You can you can um, go around Facebook as the page. So if I wanted to go, our, our local community is called Open Hearts Gathering. If I wanted to use Facebook as Open Hearts Gathering, I could go around and I could post comments on, on, uh, on local people's profiles and invite them to our gatherings and, and, and do those kinds of things. Um, I don't, we don't do that as much, um, but that's, that's certainly something that, that uh, churches and faith communities could do. All right, and um, let's see. So, fan pages have become a a growing popular way that Facebook is trying to help uh, companies and public figures and communities to engage uh, their own community people that are already connected. Uh, talk a bit about blogging. How has that mm. factored into your um, your your community and also your own voice because you you've been blogging uh, for a long time. Um, blogging has been credited or blamed for this whole emerging emergent church conversation. <laughs> uh, some of which has happened online, but I find a lot of it actually happens on the ground. And oh, yeah. on online is kind of the tip of the iceberg to just give you a glimpse that hey, there's something happening over here, and you can join in on our occasional on the grounds gathering. Yeah. Um, Talk, talk a bit about that. Wow, yeah, so my, my sort of relationship with blogging has definitely evolved and changed over the years. Um, it used to be, um, I would say prior to Facebook, it used to be the place where every little, you know, link to an interesting article or website or, you know, that was where it would go. And then sort of Facebook has kind of taken over that. And um, in my personal blogging, I guess a few years ago, I really shifted to, I'm really only going to post it something on my personal blog if it's a longer, uh, more thoughtful, thought out um, something that I want to say. Um, and so um, I kind of made that shift. But I've kind of shifted back um, to trying to just be more consistent, talk about um, certain topics specifically. Um, and and I, I, a few months ago, I started blogging specifically on, on the missional church for pathios.com. And so all of the sort of missional church that I had been posting on my personal blog, I've shifted over to the Pathios blog, and um, and sort of my personal brand, if you will, the the the, the categories that I sort of try to limit myself to in my personal blog blogging are telling stories and throwing parties, um, which is still pretty broad categories the way that I define them. Um, um, it gives me a lot of latitude to st still talk about a lot of different things that I care about and um, am in interested in. Um, but those things go on the personal blog, and all of this sort of missional church stuff goes over to the Pathios blog now. So I have two, I have two blogs um, that I'm that I'm doing, and occasionally write for Huffington Post, um, um, and those are other other things that uh, I somehow make the decision that 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 will fit Huffington Post better than my personal blog. So now that you're in the Pathios neighborhood, what is Pathios? It's kind of been a fast rising online community that uh, has recently shown up drawing a lot of uh, church and religious leaders over there. What's going yeah. on? Yeah, so it's, it's the, the tagline for Pathios is hosting the conversation on faith. Um, so it's a, it's a multi-faith um, web portal. You know, folks who remember BeliefNet um, a few years ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago now, um, was, was bought out by some folks, and, and the site sort of... Uh, the energy around it's kind of shifted, and um, and Pathios has just kind of emerged. It's kind of it's a it's an internet startup out of Colorado that's kind of just come out of nowhere, raised a lot of VC money to to make it happen, gotten a lot of uh, 
of, of, of pretty high profile bloggers from the from the atheist community, from the Muslim community, from the evangelical community, um, people like Scott McKnight and others, uh, from the progressive Christian community, um, and uh, and so it's it's a it's this uh, pretty broad platform, um, and uh, it's you know I, I one of the things that's emerged for me over over the last five to seven years has been a, a, a commitment toward interfaith dialogue and understanding. And so being able to participate in a web platform that, that um, uh, is doing that um, has been great. Um, so it's interesting. Yes. And uh, I, I've just re-entered the world of podcasting with this podcast. Yeah. And so uh, we're beginning to see um, energy uh, move, continuing in the blogging world that it's evolved. Uh, podcasting is uh, re-emerging in some ways, I, I think, because of technology is improving and making it easier for that content to be um, listened to and carried with uh, different smartphones and devices. And then um, YouTube has really taken off and shaped the world. And, yeah. And then now live streaming. And so multimedia engagement with audience and content provider and also people to people is really accelerating. And one of the things I'm curious about and wondering uh, in your multitude of missional networks, I was thinking, looking at just some of your links, you're kind of like the NASCAR brand with all these different <laughs> networks that you're a part of and wearing different hats and different roles. Uh, I don't know, sure, how, not sure how you manage all of those brands and names, but I think you're doing okay. Um, Thank you. But um, that aside, uh, where have you seen a good... Um, engaging conversations that are not centered around one person. Do, do you see good hmm. discussion boards or other modes of facilitating um, church leaders' participation? Hmm. That's an interesting the question. on the ground conversations. Yeah. I was just having this conversation. Uh, I, this is what your question makes me think of. I, I, um, I just was having this conversation with Kathy Escobar who is co-pastor of a church in Colorado called The Refuge. And she was just here with us here in Charlotte for a learning party that we hosted um, for about 40, 50 people. And um, she and I were talking, what, she's been a part of the leadership team for a thing called Transform Network, which is a, a missional community formation network that we started three years ago. And the focus of Transform, one of these hats, one of these NASCAR patches I have on, um, is, is, is regional gatherings and then an online space to help people uh, get connected, share questions, share resources. But the regional gatherings, um, this is the, a big shift I've, I've seen happening, um, um, in a sense, away from the larger national conferences towards these smaller, more regional gatherings. Um, because the reality is people are busy, they've got their heads down, they're doing their own thing, they're, they're focused on you know, just trying to you know, do what they're called to do. Um, and and even there, even the people who um, are in their own cities who are doing similar things and have similar hearts and passions, they 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 don't get to spend time with them. They don't really um, connect with them. And so um, these 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 smaller regional gatherings um, are are helping to to facilitate that. Um, we um, we're going to be doing another transform uh, uh, regional event in Fort Worth, Texas next April. April 5 and 6, and um, I'm excited about that, um, bringing sort of missional practitioners from that region together. Um, and, um, you know, one of, the, one of the other patches I have on is Wild Goose Festival. Um, Wild Goose Festival, I'm part of the local planning team for Wild Goose. It's been an East Coast festival uh, the last couple of years, but we just did a West Coast festival. Whole, you know, uh, in the regional sense, you got a whole different group of people. Some of the same folks, but but um, who have come from different parts of the country. But but um, a, a, you know, a different group of folks who are in that region who are able to connect and participate and engage and and um, so yeah, I think that's um, um, I think that's a big thing. And and the web, you know, um, uh, I, I I haven't seen. Um, too many more of these, but I, but these ideas of doing these sort of online conferences, one day, um, kind of uh, like the nines, 
some of the things that Leadership Network has done, um, I think, um, are really um, intriguing. And, um, and uh, I, you know, I've kicked around ideas with folks about trying to do s something similar to that. I think there's, there's an opportunity there that, that could be really, really beneficial. So. Yeah, I mean, the opportunity is wide open. In the business world, there's a lot of things happening in the sense of uh, webinars. Yep. So just being a present and having a conversation around a presentation, uh, it's always uh, helpful to have a conversation starter rather than just putting 20 people on a Google Plus Hangout, for example, and saying, <laughs> you know, people looking at each other as well, what do we talk about? Exactly. Um, and I guess in the more progressive side of Christianity, the the one example that comes to mind is the ooze. They've really fostered uh, a message thread kind of conversation uh, about faith. And yeah. as you described, just kind of run through your head about examples of where online conversations have really taken off, where people are invited in, people can come in and out. It, it's it's challenging to do um, to have an on, online, ongoing conversation right. uh, that's very different than an offline party or offline gathering like Wild Goose Chase. But, and this is where I wanted to tap into some of your uh, wisdom and experience as a community architect because that seemed to connote a way to uh, facilitate uh, online community where people are connecting online as well as offline. Right. So describe what that role would look like and how you facilitate that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a, it's a it's a title that I gave myself. Um, I stole it from uh, um, a friend of mine um, uh, who who had that title uh, at uh, at Zappos actually, Thomas Knoll, who was an early uh, uh, blogger as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, to me, it, it it it's it's it connotes yeah, just like you're saying, this idea of how do we how do we um, use the tools and the technologies as effectively as possible to foster the greatest amount of engagement, conversation, and, uh, and participation. And I, you know, I can't say that I, I, I've, I've been able to do that extremely well um, uh, with, the, with the Transform Network site in recent months because of other, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, pressing um, responsibilities and things that I've had. But, um, and I should interject, uh, Transform Network runs on a software called Ning, right. which is like a private social network. And Ning used to be a freemium model where you, had, uh, where you were allowed to launch a free social network for your own whatever topic and now it's a paid-only model, and they have over a million private social networks. Yeah, yeah. And they and it, provide a number of great tools if people would use it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, um, it's hung in there. It's hung in there um, because it's, there, there are some benefits to it that supersede just having a Facebook group. Although the, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a part of a number of Facebook groups where there is a, a much higher level of participation and engagement and involvement. Um, there's actually, uh, for the Emergent Village Network, there's an Emergent Village Facebook group that is um, incredibly active um, with, with, I don't know, I, I want to say a dozen posts a day and, and, and comments galore. Um, and so, so Facebook groups are, are really a great way um, because it seems like you know having a Facebook uh, account is almost ubiquitous at this point, and um, and so it's it's much easier with Ning. You have to set up another account. It's a, it's another thing for people to manage, but um, but if it's if it's used well, um, there are definitely benefits to it, and um, and so yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm we're still using both. Um, well, I, I I use Facebook for other groups, and we use Ning for the transform stuff. So. Okay, so let's talk about your latest venture, Sogo yeah. Media. Is that related to social media and missional church? I hope so. It is. It is. Um, so, so Sogo is a new kind of Christian television network on YouTube that we'll be launching in October um, with a number of video bloggers, um, shows from different video contributors that I'm really excited about. Um, it's... It, the idea um, sprung out of just what I had been reading about Google's plans for YouTube, 
um, since really the beginning of this year. And some of the statistics um, about the growth of YouTube were really just astounding. So um, for folks who you know, um, may not be aware, um, YouTube is, is the second largest search engine after Google, and Google owns YouTube, so Google owns the top two search engines. But there's actually 72 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. If you think about that, that's more than three days of video uploaded every minute. And, um, and YouTube just turned seven years old a few months ago. And in the last year, it's actually grown by 50%. And so there seems to be this exponential growth that YouTube is experiencing. Again, we, you know, um, it, it's driven by mobile devices. That, you know, we, we've got video. Uh, uh, capabilities on our phones all times to upload that stuff. YouTube's got a great platform that makes it super and easy. And we're having this conversation on a YouTube platform. How and we are. Yeah, because Google Plus Hangout on Air goes straight to your YouTube channel now. Um, so, so, so there's all the reasons why this is happening, but the thing that struck me was um, this idea of curation it, it, as, as volume, massive volumes of content um, get uploaded to the web and up, uploaded to YouTube, the, the role of the curator becomes that much more important. And I just started looking around and asking myself, who is curating the religion and spirituality space on YouTube? Um, because at least two of the biggest viral videos of this year alone were religion or spirituality based, right? Um, the I Invisible Children, Coney 2012 video. And the uh, Jefferson Beth Key, um, I love Jesus but hate religion, spoken word video, which, by the way, he has just signed a book deal with Thomas Nelson. So he went from spoken word artist to viral video star to, you know, published author. Um, and, and, and so I just started looking around, and, and a lot of the Christian media outlets that I saw had YouTube channels where they were uploading a video here or a video there. Uh, but nobody, uh, but it was all, it was more content. It was more content and it wasn't really curating and helping filter and sift through all the existing stuff that was there and helping people find that. Now, a lot of that happens naturally already. You find this, this, this stuff will find you through Facebook and Twitter. Your friends will find that interesting video and they'll share it with you. Um, but for every one of those that you actually see, there's probably a dozen um, that you would be as much more interested in or, you know, uh, excited about that you, that you never see um, because, of the, because there's just lost in the sea. Of, and uh, and of in fact, content. there is no category for religion or spirituality on YouTube. That's right. That's right. So and that's, you there's know, no place for that content to live, much less get curated. Right. So it, it, it's, uh, so that's, that was the original impetus was, was to really sort of try to, um, take a hold of this space, this religion and spirituality space on YouTube, and, and, and do that role of curation. And at the same time, we, we, we have connections with all of these great voices, with people who, who um, are, are sharing great ideas. And so we wanted to, to create a channel um, like some of the new um, kinds of YouTube channels. This is the other piece um, that Google is really trying to compete with broadcast television. Um, the, the average amount of time people watch TV is like uh, two or three hours a day. And the average amount of time people spend on YouTube is, is, is much less than that. I think it's uh, uh, like 15 minutes a day or something like that. Um, and so Google's driven, driven on advertising. And, and in order to, to do that, they need to have uh, higher quality content and longer form content. And that's what Google, Google is moving been moving um, people towards on YouTube. And so creating new channels, new higher quality, longer form uh, video channels. And so that's what we're, we're trying to kind of, kind of uh, move into that space, create a channel with a number of these different voices um, and, and, and also do this, this uh, curation piece. And um, I think all of that together, um, I think it's gonna be something pretty unique and original and um, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be there first and we'll do it the best and, and uh, it'll be a successful venture. So I'm excited. Oh, very cool. And we'll put a link to Sogo Media in the show notes. 
And uh, here at Social Media Church, once in a while, we'll uh, touch on some uh, touchy subjects. So when it comes to organizing church, I think the two sticking points that are very difficult to uh, navigate and to figure out is the economic engine or finances. Yeah. Because when it comes to organizing, it's about um, a big piece of it is uh, who, who gets paid to do the organizing and to do the content uh, generator, generating and distribution. And then the second big piece of the budget pie is uh, facilities. Where do people can, can they physically meet? And so for the missional church context that you're in, how do you work with those issues? Um, yeah, this is, this, is a big, this is one of the biggest questions um, that everybody is still really wrestling with. Um, because it is, um, it is a different model. And if you, you know, if you're an existing, um, sort of membership driven church, um, and, and looking to move in a missional direction, um, it'll force you to ask some of these questions, um, about what do we do with budgets and buildings and, and things like that. Um, cause it, uh, like, um, Reggie McNeil says, it's a, it's a different scorecard for success. But, but yeah, there, there are bills to pay. And, and um, one of the things that's, um, you know, it, deeply concerning to me is, is folks who want to do missional church, but they don't want to think hard about sustainability. Um, I think there's a healthy, you know, um, way of saying that a faith community can have a, a life cycle that, that churches and faith communities are not necessarily meant to exist forever and ever, amen. But at the same time, when you're trying to get something started, when you're trying to, you know, uh, if to use the language of a of a startup, you you need funding, you need you need resources to get something off the ground, and then you need to have a model for sustainability if you want it to to uh, go and grow. Um, and um, and so there's all kinds of different models that people are exploring. Um, and uh, I think a lot of missional communities, um, like our, our local community here, start off with no building and really no, no paid staff um, and, and are really looking to keep things, you know, do a, a lean startup um, where they keep the costs very low, um, uh, but, but, uh, but to have hopefully high community involvement and engagement um, and, you, you know, use existing spaces, use third spaces. Meet in coffee houses and bars and and um, and theaters and things like that. Whatever whatever works in your local context and um, and uh, and. Well, here in I, Southern Cal, we can just meet outside because it's always sunny and seventy. There you go. <laughs> and, and and I know people who do that. I mean, uh, folks up in Portland, uh, uh, Home PDX is a, a homeless church. Uh, folks uh, meet out in parks and and things like that. So I mean, it's people are doing that. But um, the thing that I would, I, I, I have to, I feel like I have to interject because I was just in a conversation about this recently is, is this whole question of fundraising for missional church and do you ask people to, to tithe and to donate? And I really, I really feel like if people, um, you know, it, again, it's sort of like, is there, is there buy-in on the vision for what this community is about? And what what this community is is trying to do together, in participating together in God's mission in the in the neighborhood, then then you got to talk about the financial stuff, and you can't sweep it under the rug. And you you've got to be able to say, if we want to be able to do X, Y, and Z, whatever X, Y, and Z are, we need we need money to do those things. And so let's talk about that. And who can step up? And who has resources? Because people do, um, and people just need to be asked. And, um, but it, it, um, I think it's getting harder and harder to ask people to pay for buildings and salaries and things like that. Um, because they, because the desire is for social change and positive social change and, and really making an impact in the, in the neighborhood and the community. Um, plenty of people will give to support church to just for their own spiritual growth and, 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 uh, and, and, and all that. And, you know, but I think there's, there's more and more people who are desiring, I want to I, I give 
to something that I see is making a difference beyond me and my family that's making a difference right here in the neighborhood, right here in the community. And so missional churches need to, need to make the case for what that looks like and, uh, and, and, um, and then fall through. All right. Well, thanks for sharing some of your thoughts. It, it is a tough thing that people are wrestling with, so, so I wanted to get a little inside scoop that some yeah. things that you're uh, hearing and experiencing. Man, we need to talk more often. Yeah. You've raised yeah. more questions than answered <laughs> in true like a, emergent form. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, it's been great. Um, it's been great uh, just tracking with you, DJ, over the years, and um, yeah. I'm excited about what you're doing with Social Media Church, and I appreciate you inviting me to come on and talk about all the all the different various crazy things. And uh, I might have to work on the NASCAR patch thing. I don't know. I, I, maybe I can get money if I actually put the patches all over myself or something. Help no, so as you're as you're sharing what the challenge of uh, sustainability, it's like okay, so we've got we're in a 21st century where things can be sustained in alternative financial models. Um, things that are being sustained in some ways online through uh, advertising and foundations. Yep. And uh, perhaps there's a missional community model that is uh, sustained using social media, ad supported, and by vocational people. Right. So I th throw that in there, kick yeah. it around your network, see who can make it fly. Yeah. Well, and I'll throw out this because my full-time work has been working with the Disciples of Christ denomination, but that's coming to an end at the end of this year. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, 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 I'm kicking around the idea of doing a Kickstarter project to try to raise funds to be able to do all of the, the Transform Network stuff and all of the, all of the different missional stuff that uh, I, I would really love to be able to uh, keep working on. So you might you might uh, see a Kickstarter project for me in in the next month or two. Okay, we'll keep tabs with you from here. Awesome. Great seeing you in person, and we'll stay connected online. Thanks, DJ. All right, thanks, Steve.